Okay. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning again for the people who have just uh, uh, come on board. Uh, welcome to the second day of uh, Beyond X. We had a grueling day yesterday. We had we went through a whole lot of uh, uh, exponential technologies and how they're going to change the world. We got wonderful speakers. We got wonderful dialogue from the audience. And this second day, I think, will be even more grueling and a, a lot more exciting, even more exciting as we go through the rest of the, the, the speakers and also the, the, the issues and topics that we're gonna to go through. Uh, good morning again, my name is uh, Lin Hao. I'm the Director of Human Resource at the Ong Edong Group. Uh, we have with us uh, our moderator, uh, Mr. Go Tixin. Uh, Tixin is the Director of uh, Civil and Structural Engineering of Ranking and Hill, which is also part of the Ong Edong Group. He's our CNS Director, CS Engineering Director. Uh, now, and more importantly, we have our guests, uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Go, Dr. Go Kim Song from SUTD. And we also have Mr. Jeremy Sirock, who is president of uh, Thaibots. He's based in, in the US. Uh, now, some housekeeping first, and just bear with me one, two minutes. I'll just go through some basic housekeeping as we go through so that we have a wonderful experience in the next hour. Uh, now, please uh, do make comments, everybody in the audience, please do make comments in the chat. If you like to chat with us or chat with your friends, please do uh, do, the, do the chat button. If you like to ask questions, please feel free to use a QA and a button. Uh, at the end of every session, uh, when, the, when the speaker has uh, completed his, uh, his session, we will go into a Q&A for about 10 minutes. So make sure you've got, you've got some burning questions that you want to ask. Uh, don't be shy, please put in the Q&A uh, uh, Q button. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, please uh, do so in the chat. Uh, we have a control center, mission control, that uh, going to be able to help you on that. This session is also streamed live on uh, Ong and Ong Facebook uh, at, uh, at uh, Ongoing 360. So we are live on Facebook at the same time. That's uh, just in case the Zoom fills up and, and you can ask your friends to watch on Facebook at the same time. Okay, here we go. Beyond X, this is the second year we're running it. Beyond X is an annual festival. Uh, we showcase fresh technology, speakers. We want to inspire creativity and innovation. We want to be inviting the most prestigious experts, subject matters in the field, in their own fields, so that we can share the knowledge with everybody in the world. And more importantly, how do we bring the world forward and move the world? So we want to impact the world by sharing knowledge. So if you uh, uh, are a knowledge player, or you are interested in sharing knowledge, this is the right thing. You come to the right place this morning. Okay, uh, the series of events for today, uh, we are looking at 11 to 12 o'clock. We will, and then there's another session at two to three. I, I won't read out because you can see it on screen faster. And another session at four to five. So right now we are looking at the rise of uh, robots and automation in the construction sector, uh, starting in about two minutes. Here are our speakers this morning, uh, Mr. Jeremy Sirock. Uh, Jeremy is a co-founder and president of the Advanced Construction Robotics. Uh, he's based in the US. Pittsburgh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have also with us this morning, uh, Dr. Go Kim Song, who is an Associate Prof and Director of uh, Graduate Studies for SUTD. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Go is especially, uh, what he's heading up the Articulated Systems and Biomechanics Lab at SUTD. Uh, we have, again, the moderators would be Mr. Go Tixin and myself, uh, Lin Pao. Okay, without further ado, oh, okay, before we go further, the next session, just, just uh, put a note in your, in your phone and your, your mobile devices. We're starting at 2 p.m. Singapore time, disrupting project management with blockchain and digital twin. Uh, so we have VeChain and Autodesk, uh, uh, Autodesk on board. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to, uh, well, fantastic, good enough. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy, would you like to share with us your your, your thoughts, your knowledge, uh, how you're going to change the world? Jeremy, the floor is yours, 20 minutes. Thank sure, you. thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this talk. And I <clears throat> hope you guys enjoy and hear a little bit more about uh, where we are at with adding robots to the construction site. Um, I do have a presentation, so Hopefully here I can successfully share my screen. Yeah. 
Yes, Jeremy. Yes, sir. We are on screen presentation. Can you see the presentation? It is, uh, is the presentation up? Yes, it is. You have to go into slideshow mode. Okay. On your bottom let me right. let me share the other screen here. Yes, wonderful. All successful. Yes. Great. Great. Well, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jeremy Searock and uh, I'm the co-founder and president of Advanced Construction Robotics, uh, which, is, which is a robotics and artificial intelligence development firm based in the United States. Um, and we uh, make robots for the construction site. Uh, I want to talk, tell you guys a little bit story about how I got into construction robots and uh, where do I think this technology is going in the future. And, and for those of you who run construction firms, um, how you should be thinking about the technology and beginning to incorporate it into your operations. So uh, I have a, a history in, in robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon University um, over 15 years ago uh, as a graduate student, um, really in the beginning days at which the Defense Department in the United States started to fund uh, the, their grand challenges or the off-road autonomous car uh, systems. I was able to have a, a wonderful experience there. And I think all of us uh, at that time uh, were, were excited because we knew that robotics at some point in the future would really change in which the world operated. We didn't know how long that would take um, and we didn't know what forms that would take. Um, but I think I am realizing now that uh, we are well into the next uh, industrial revolution centered around robotics and artificial intelligence. I also worked at uh, Carnegie Mellon University's um, Applied Research Lab. Um, I got to work on autonomous uh, off-road trucks. Uh, I teamed the first ever autonomous helicopter and uh, delivered by, or autonomous ground vehicle delivered by an autonomous helicopter. Um, and uh, helped write the, the uh, AI software for the first ever autonomous naval ship. So I have a, a rich background in autonomous vehicles and uh, I do not have a construction background. But I, I ran into uh, another uh, executive here in the US who is the founder and owner of a construction, heavy civil construction company that builds bridges dams, uh, drill shafts, and, and many other heavy civil uh, attributes. And uh, we decided to form a company together called Advanced Construction Robotics. And uh, that was about three and a half years ago. And uh, we are well into the throes of, of designing our second product and our first product already being commercialized. So what I hope is not a surprise is that we have a real construction robot, right? I'm not here to tell you guys about what's coming in the future. Construction robots are here now. We're not the only company um, producing them, um, but we have one that's available to purchase. You can buy a construction robot, which I'll tell you about today, uh, for, your, for your site today. And I think if I uh, ask in a, normal, uh, in a normal talk where I could see your faces, I would ask, well, who, you know, who wants a robot that can, uh, you know, save 10 workers worth of work every day, uh, make the schedule go faster, be safer, people enjoy coming to work a bit more every day. I think all of you guys would raise your hand, but when I say the word robot, robot has a connotation associated with it. Most people think about robots from what they've read in science fiction books or uh, cartoons or videos that they've seen online and they really don't think about it as just another tool for the website. And uh, I think when you, you say, let's, let's go uh, use robots on a construction site, you, you're, you're gonna ask yourself, well, is that really real? Does it really work? You know, your typical reaction is you're fearful. I, I think it's the other way around. I think that you should be fearful that your competitor is not fearful about it and, and has a robot that you do not. Uh, because I believe that we're on the 
the very beginning of a, of a new industrial revolution um, centered around robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, and due to some of the, you know, the awards that we've received in the past several years and the many, many, many articles uh, written about it, I think the world also believes that we're, we're moving into our next, next uh, revolution. So let me explain a, little, a bit what that means. So disruption can be quick. Uh, this is a common, uh, there is, uh, you know, of course, disruption science that you can read all about. Uh, but the simplest example that I love that I've seen before is if you think back in the early industrial revolution of the 20th century, uh, there used to be all horse and buggies, right? This is a picture from Fifth Avenue on, in New York City uh, in the early 1900s, and it was 99% uh, horse and buggy and only 1% cars. And you can see, if you squint your eyes, the, the one car that's in this picture. Uh, within a short 10-year period, uh, it completely shifted, right? Combustion engines became reliable, and the Fifth Avenue in New York City had 99% cars and only 1% horse and buggy with that circle around that horse and buggy. So it's typically not a long time from when the new technology is adapted until it completely transforms the industry. And that's more than just the cars back then, right? Think about the whole supply chain necessary to support horses, to get rid of the manure, to provide feed, to provide salary and leather goods for the horses. All those businesses were disrupted and went uh, out of business. So, so the motto back then was um, new technology, which was electricity and combustion engines provided unlimited horsepower to create new products. And you would take the old way, way in which old things were done, apply electricity and combustion engines and create whole new businesses. And that motto was uh, done for, for over 30 years uh, during that industrial revolution. And I think that's happening right now. I think that uh, old businesses are taking the way they do things, applying robotics and artificial intelligence, which is essentially a limited brain power to their operations and doing the same job in a much more efficient way. And we believe, of course, while I chose to, to do this in the construction industry, is that I think uh, construction is really ripe for disruption. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in the Pacific region market, um, but from my studies of the U.S. market and at least in Europe, uh, there is a massively growing demand for use of construction uh, that is not uh, uh, going away. There's, there's, I think the, the estimates say that the global construction industry will be at a $15 uh, trillion a year uh, mark. Uh, I think it's no uh, secret that there's a large labor scarcity there's simply not enough skilled workers to meet the demand. Um, I've heard various uh, reasons for that from, from India where there's certainly lots of people, uh, but their, their demands or their goals for meeting their construction development outstrips the, the demand there. I've also heard challenges, uh, I think I was talking with the director from here in ONG, is that uh, with COVID shutdowns, uh, the transient or immigrated immigration workers uh, can't come in to finish the projects. And uh, I've heard the same stories uh, in Europe. And uh, in general, the productivity rate of the construction industry is, is one of the lowest if you compare those to the average uh, productivity rate of the rest of the global economy. Uh, so it's very ripe for disruption and robotics and artificial intelligence are, are a way to, to make up for that. So, <clears throat> That's why I, we founded this company. Uh, so our goal is to use the latest in robotics and artificial intelligence to both invent and innovate these products, but also to commercialize them because it's, it's not really, you don't really complete the whole picture if you just invent a robot, but don't do all the work necessary to integrate it into the current operations of the industry. Uh, and that uh, takes work, it takes educating the industry, and helping them to realize uh, the gains that they can make. So every product that we make uh, follows these four pillars of, of enhancing productivity, improving safety, increasing profits, and reducing schedule risks. And I haven't found a, a contractor yet who uh, doesn't like 
decreasing their overall schedule from, from weeks uh, to months um, by using a robot. <clears throat> so our first product, and when I first uh, founded it, I really almost did not want to call it a robot because like I said, the word robot has uh, connotations and people think about different things. So I like to say it's just another uh, tool for the industry. Uh, so TieBot is an autonomous rebar tying robot. That means uh, when you're doing reinforced concrete, which is in many different applications, you of course place down the rebar in a grid paste pattern. Uh, and typically you have to tie that rebar together or fasten it together so that it doesn't move when you pour the concrete uh, into the in, or into the rebar mat. Uh, so we invented a autonomous robot that does that. So I'll play a short video that will give you a quick uh, introduction to, to this product. Advanced Construction Robotics presents TieBot. TieBot, an autonomous rebar tying robotic system tailored for the construction industry. The new innovative method for tying rebar, which improves workforce safety, enhances productivity, and reduces scheduling risks. TieBot autonomously navigates bridge decks, identifies and ties rebar intersections using fully developed robotics and artificial intelligence technology. TieBot arrives on site, transported by truck and 40-foot trailer, accompanied by the QCT. The unit offers a toolless assembly configuration and can be ready for use with minimal support from your crew and equipment. Extremely easy to integrate with your current operation, the unit uses the existing screed rails already on site as its track for movement. While in use, the unit does not impede any other infrastructure or construction equipment. Before TieBot begins working, the construction crew places the bar and ties enough of the intersections to secure it in place, approximately 10%. As crews continue to place and frame tie in the bar, TieBot begins tying any remaining intersections behind the crew. As crews finish with the bottom mat, they can then begin placing and framing the top mat, following behind TieBot. Once TieBot finishes the bottom mat, the machine can then be moved under its own power back to the start of the top mat and continue until completion. TieBot has the flexibility to accommodate many structure types, design specifications, and even work in inclement weather. TieBot by Advanced Construction Robotics. Innovating infrastructure. So I always like to sh point out a couple items that are common questions when, when I introduce this product. The first, like I said, that this, this is not a prototype. Uh, it's not an experiment. Uh, this is a real product that is doing real work, uh, mostly on bridges today. Um, they've been working for several years and, and saving contractors uh, a lot of money. Uh, uh, contractors can, use this to supplement eight to 10 workers for each tie bot on site. Uh, and I also like to point out it's not remote controlled. Uh, it is fully autonomous, meaning it has own vision system to see the rebar, decide where to tie and to go tie it. There is no uh, uh, in, um, control necessary from a person. It also is no programming. You do not put BIM into it. You do not tell it where the rebar intersections are. You do not give it a rebar schedule. It physically sees the intersections with its own camera system. And it's fully autonomous once you, once you say go. Uh, so we really uh, are excited about it. We do, uh, people often ask, often ask for case studies. Uh, so we did a very detailed case study on a bridge that we did in 2019 that was 188 meters in length. It had over 125,000 uh, rebar intersections and we compared its productivity rate uh, to that of a human crew. Uh, and as you can see, TieBot uh, can tie up to a thousand ties per hour in a typical, at least in the US, uh, ties between 60 to 130 ties per hour. So we looked at a, a so we actually realized real 34% uh, days on sites uh, saving as well as 34% in man hours, which led to a overall dollar savings of about 43%. So like I said, Advanced Construction Robotics is not uh, just about tying rebar. Uh, we are going to make products as quickly as we 
can to integrate those into the construction operations. Uh, we are well into the development of our second product um, and we will commercialize it into the industry next year. Uh, we call it IronBot and it is, it is the obvious next step to partner with TieBot. It is going to uh, lift, carry, and place rebar according to specification. Um, it is going to uh, pick up entire bundles of rebar and place them one at a time according to, to specification. Uh, the, the development is going well and uh, we look forward to uh, giving that an, out to the industry next year. So people often ask, you know, our first uh, uh, market we were going after was the bridge market uh, because my partner uh, owns a bridge development company, but of course, seeing rebar and tying it and placing rebar is applicable to any reinforced concrete application. Uh, so we are in the midst of working and, and uh, discussing uh, partnerships with various companies to, to take this technology into the entire reinforced concrete market. So like I said, uh, we're, we're very excited about where we are in the, the products we're developing. Uh, again, we're not the only company out there making construction robots. Uh, we certainly believe we're, we're far ahead in, in integrating th into operations. And I really encourage the owners and uh, managers and designers out there to look at how you can integrate or futurely integrate robots into your workforce because it simply saves you money, is safer, uh, and uh, you really get a better control of your schedule. Uh, I thank you for your time and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. We know uh, slightly a lot more now about uh, how robotics are used uh, on, on site, uh, especially for large span slabs like this. Uh, may I call upon uh, uh, our moderator, Mr. Gotixi, who is our director of uh, civil and structural engineering, uh, to take questions or maybe to ask some questions himself, to get the discussion going. Uh, uh, Dixie, you have the floor. You have the mic. Dixie, you, you are still on mute. Uh, you might want to might be muted. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I, I was having some problems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, um, I'm Gu uh from Rankin and Hill, CNS the director. Uh, uh, Rankin and Hill actually is the engineering branch of uh, Ong Yong. Uh, so um, the robotics um itself, I think is very interesting. A uh, very interesting topic. Um, something which actually has um, never crossed our mind in a local context. Uh, uh, good to hear that actually uh, it's not just also for bridges because originally I was thinking that it's actually more uh, applicable for, for bridges. Uh, it looks like I think uh, building structures, it, it, it is also uh, applicable for, for on-site usage. Uh, the, the question um, in terms of the uh, usage of robotics, I think in the local context is basically uh, more of the uh, productivity uh, uh, saving. La. So um, roughly, uh, what kind of percentage it, it would be a, a saving? Because we, we, um, in the local context, we have this building construction authority or, or BCA, we call it, and, and they are actually very particular or are very interested in, in products or, or in uh, uh, innovations that actually can save man hours. So roughly in terms of the comparison between, uh, 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 I mean, a typical uh, on-site uh, rebar tying and, and of course your, your robotics uh, uh, yes. Yes. I how much understand. Savings. Yes. Yeah. So there's there's two ways to describe that. Um, so the 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 speed of the machine uh, is equivalent uh, is equivalent to about uh, between six to ten workers. So headcount in in terms of people, uh, and depending upon the application, uh, can save you between thirty five. Uh, to 50% of the total man hours in the rebar, in the uh, total rebar installation activity, which would be um, carrying, placing, and tying. So in, in terms of the uh, robotics tying um, rebar, um, currently looking at the pictures is more for 
um, slabs and all those. Um, what about like in terms of uh, beams and columns? Um, you know, even you're talking right. about whether you get possibility of, of having that also. Right. So, so there's a couple of ways to answer that. Uh, there's sort of the short term and the long term, right? The, the, uh, of course, the long term is that we intend to apply this technology to, to all reinforced concrete applications. Um, so the, you know, the vision system and the AI system necessary to identify the intersections and make the right plan on what the tie is, of course, applicable uh, to, to columns as well as vertical work. Um, but you need to deploy that in a different, you know, uh, skeleton or, or hardware system to, to do that. Uh, so the, the near term is that we're going to uh, uh, work uh, on horizontal uh, concrete slabs first. Uh, so of course, bridges was our first. Uh, large buildings uh, such as warehouses or data, cent data centers um, or um, you know, tilt up uh, construction and uh, would, is, is sort of the, the next steps. And then we can continue to make the, the deployment skeleton smaller and smaller to apply to other applications. Mm, I see, yeah. So I, I guess uh, there's much more um, that we can look forward to. Uh, I, I guess uh, from the point of productivity, which is uh, the local market is always talking about, this is a product that uh, is worth for the industry to be looking into. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, maybe we can move on to the second speaker. Thank you. Okay, sure. I'll share my screen. I'm on mute, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeremy and, and Tixin for the wonderful discussion. We can continue later in the Q&A if there are more questions and things will pop up. But in the meantime, uh, may we call upon uh, Dr. So. Dr. So uh, from SUTD, uh, would you like to uh, share with us your, your, your thoughts and insights? Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. So. Okay. Thank, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to give uh, uh, and, and sharing of my view on, on in this topic. Um, uh, so, a brief introduction. Uh, I'm Kim Song. I'm, I'm a faculty member at uh, Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design. This is actually the uh, fourth autonomous university in Singapore uh, that was established uh, uh, close to 10 years ago in collaboration with MIT. Uh, so this, this picture here shows you the campus. Uh, there's a blend of east and west. All right, uh, uh, this structure here, uh, for those who like architectural, uh, is actually uh, uh, restored by one of our own faculty in, in SUTD. Uh, it's, it's actually a structure donated by Jackie Chan. All right, so if you come to this, Happen to come to this campus, uh, this is one of the scenic, scenic sites that you must come uh, and, and take a look at all these structures that, uh, uh, that was donated to, to this school. And, and uh, guess what? Actually, this is the oldest structure in Singapore. Uh, if you take back to the history in Singapore context, right? Um, so um, so um, I'm actually in the engineering product development pillar and, and also uh, playing a role of a director of our graduate studies uh, for, for graduate school uh, operations. So a, a quick uh, overview of what I do. Uh, actually, my, my background is, is, is on robotics and additive manufacturing, right? Uh, uh, you, you can see that actually I, I, my, my research work here actually spans quite a fair bit from uh, mechanism robotics, like designing robots that can climb, uh, uh, do mapping, uh, working collectively. Uh, uh, this, this is the kind of stuff we do in, in the academic settings here. And even the interface for the robot where you see the, the, the hand glove device where we are able to capture human intent and actually translate it into some computer algorithm to understand what, what the human gesture is all about. Uh, and there's also another spectrum that actually I work on is actually how do I make use of robots uh, to do additive manufacturing and the focus has been purely based on um, uh, metal printing. Uh, 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 which I'll explain a bit more later in my talk, All right? Okay, so, um, so this talk here, actually, I'll focus two parts of my work that actually probably more relevant uh, to, to the, the, the question asking here, uh, which actually focus more on large-scale manufacturing, all right? Um, uh, because I, I think construction is a fit form of uh, manufacturing in my perspective, lah, right? Uh, uh, where you are supposed to to put materials together to reconstruct some structures that uh, that you can have it in the environment. All right. So 
So uh, the first part, actually, I'll focus one of the work that actually I did uh, earlier on, on uh, robots uh, uh, that actually we developed to, to help uh, in the oil and gas industry. But I, I don't foresee actually extending this uh, into the construction environment. I mean, the whole intent actually was to, to uh, not take away the workforce, but to augment the workforce and so that they work in a better uh, and safer environment. Right? That was more on the intent. Uh, the part actually, the second part was more focused more on large format printing work that I'm working on currently. So uh, in terms of robotics or automation in large for format uh, manufacturing, you can see that actually in constructions, uh, the robots most of the time are relatively huge, very, very large. Uh, um, I mean, it, it varies in different forms. Like you can start with um, highly constrained. Most of the time you can see for pre-cast pre -cast concrete, you can find that most of the robotic system they have out there is actually highly constrained because you have to do it offsite uh, uh, in a very structured environment uh, where the robot know where it is uh, so that you can have proper means of uh, positioning and, and putting all the necessary materials in place so that you can achieve the task you want. All right. Uh, on the other extreme, you, we can look at robot system as being very agile, right? Can operate in a very unstructured environment, uh, easily deployed on site, to assist the human in a variety of tasks, right? Uh, so, so for instance, you can see that this pictorial view that we draw here, that it could be that robot can be easily moved around to different segments of the construction site uh, that actually you can do some form of automation, uh, minute tasks uh, as required, uh, working together with humans in this aspect. Uh, and you can see in the research community, actually the trend is moving from the left side towards to something more agile and small, right? Uh, that can coexist with human working together. You never know that actually it could be an exoskeleton that a human wear to do all the uh, necessary work they have uh, uh, in this uh, construction site, right? Okay, so if, you, if, you, if I just focus my, my talk, uh, 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 given generally I actually show a very good perspective of all the large systems that they have been deployed, uh, I'll just show a bit more on the micro smaller system that have been developed. Uh, basically, I can classify them uh, 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 in a variety of uh, portable motion system, lah, right, on how to put a robot arm and actually make them portable and, and move around a construction site to do a variety of tasks. Um, uh, there's quite a, a bunch of solution that actually what I, I oops sorry that I that uh, that is actually based on manual handling that you see on the first top left hand corner. Uh, there are also system that actually is based on the real system where you put a robot on a rail and the rail guide the robot to a specific uh, deployable location. Uh, there are also robot systems on mobile platforms, uh, even climbing ro robots that actually achieve the task you want right. Uh, that make use of uh, the inherent metal, metallic uh, materials that actually you can use uh, uh, electromagnetism concept or magnetic concepts to echo the, the robots to, to the surface. Um, right? um, uh, and also a uh, very in innovative uh, climbing mechanism that actually allows a robot to navigate on some vertical or, or slope surfaces uh, to, to achieve the task you want. Uh, so most of the tasks I show here is actually more focused on welding, lah, if you say that. Right? The task was more for welding. Uh, but I mean, if you can have platform that do this, uh, why not designing a payload that can achieve the task you want, right? Uh, and there's another interesting concept, actually, the robot itself grid onto some large pipe structures, uh, which is actually commonly found in oil and gas, um, uh, to, to move along the pipe to, 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 uh, 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 to perform a task such as welding, all right? But if you really look at all these uh, system here you develop, they, they are actually kind of... Um, uh, uh, fix for a specific task and, and it doesn't give the kind of a uh, flexibility of a uh, hardware adaptability to the task at, at hand, uh, which, which probably in uh, construction side that uh, I don't want to have five different robot system to do five different things. All right. Can I have one different robot? Can I have one unified robot system by, by just changing a simple uh, payload on the robot uh, and it can actually perform other tasks accordingly. Right. So this is the idea that actually we are going for. Uh, so actually this, this, with this in mind, actually, we, we came up with um, a, a system actually that leverage on scaffold system because scaffold are usually erected around most construction sites uh, or even oil and gas industry that adapts to the structure itself uh, where we have a robotic system and a platform that can be easily placed on the scaffold itself 
uh, understanding. So a lot of design parameters go into this design, like whether how is it for it to maneuver in the constraint space, uh, how heavy it should go so that two workers can be easily carry this while navigating in that environment. And then even the assembly setup, it should be quite intuitive. It's more like a plug and play. Uh, but of course, on the back end to achieve all this, there's a lot of design thinking going to it, such as uh, understanding what is the workspace of the robot, where should I place the robot to achieve this task, uh, and what type of sensors I need to use so that I think the robot know where it is with respect to the work piece, right? Because this work piece right now is your big construction area, uh, and, and so that he can perform the task uh, uh, meaningfully and accurately, right? So, so these are actually some of the questions that you have to answer in order to coming out all these kind of uh, uh, lightweight mobile platforms. And, and actually, uh, uh, this, this, this development idea has been actually facilitated a lot by the advancement in lightweight cobots where, where robots can work together with human, uh, right? Uh, which means that even a robot hit the human accidentally uh, is not so da damaging uh, as compared to a bigger robot that, that will cause serious injury, all right? So all these safety features are all embedded in this kind of uh, uh, lightweight cobots currently, right? Um, which you can see the trend going on, right? All right, the more common one is the UR robot arm, which I have here. Uh, but actually, there are other vendors that actually, uh, you can see this trend going on in most of the robot manufacturers. Uh, and and on, set, on, on software side for robotics, uh, the, the, the platform that actually that has been growing a trend here is the robot operating system, which we call ROS, uh, which have a lot of built-in capability to do all those form of navigation, uh, even autonomous capability building uh, in a software environment. So, so this is a very good development kit that actually even Singapore itself is investing a lot to, to build this capability in, in Singapore landscape, all right? Uh, so this actually just give you a nutshell of uh, how easy this is to deploy. It's less than 50 kilogram, two person can carry. Uh, they can quickly even lock this down in place. Uh, 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 you can see that all these are actually just to mock up uh, the actual environment of a, uh, of a scaffold uh, constrained environment uh, that they can quickly hook, hook this up, put power source, and, and take about 90 seconds to deploy. And, and I'm just going to show you the demo that this is doing to show that uh, once this deploy, the robot has the basic autonomy to understand uh, and actually scan for the workpiece uh, and, and localize itself relative to the workpiece so that you can get a very accurate uh, seam uh, uh, estimation as well as uh, tracking of the seam to, to to achieve the welding task at hand, right? Which you can see that this is what the actually robot is doing now. Uh, right now, actually, based on the earlier scan it have, it's able to locate itself accurately and actually now tracking whether his estimation is correct and refining his algorithm uh, so that he can perform the seam uh, successfully. All right, I could have put a welding torch here. I mean, the, the dimension of all this is to simulate a welding torch, but just to show the capability, we have it as a 3D printing pen to show that uh, this can go ahead and do this kind of a uh, welding seam tracking uh, 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 approach, right, for, for this robot. Okay, I think you're going to see that it's going to do some action right now. Okay, maybe a bit thin for you to see. Right, uh, literally actually it's printing something onto this mock-up cardboard, one-to-one -one scale mock-up cardboard. Uh, and you can see this is all done automatically without any human intervention, all right? Right. Without proper localization, it's unlikely you'll get to this kind of accuracy required to do this kind of task. Lah, right? And you can see that actually it's following quite closely. Okay, you can see material is being laid there, right? To, to cover the gap that you just see. Okay. Um, so so basically it's about eight minutes with time from the first installation to the first well pass. All right. Uh, so typically in this kind of industry, it, it takes about uh, um, so give me a minute, somebody at my door. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, I think about eight minutes to deploy this onto uh, 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 the actual site, right? So this is actually where we think uh, uh, roboticists can come in and develop this kind of a uh, highly agile, adaptable uh, robotic platform that can actually work collectively human in, in a, a large construction environment, all right? Um, Another part actually I'll touch on is actually metal printing. Actually, this actually has a lot of interesting application right now, especially oil and gas uh, 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 environment for large structures uh, printing. Okay, so uh, 
the, the technology that I'm introducing is called by Art Additive Manufacturing. Typically, they call WAM. Uh, it's actually a direct energy deposition manufacturing technique uh, that builds uh, near net shape part a layer by layer on a substrate in the motion system. So you can see that actually, this is actually a print that we do in-house that we make use of welding torch, understand the geometry of the product that we need to print and, and actually translate it into some robot tool path that can allow us to do this kind of uh, manufacturing, right, uh, very seamlessly. And, and we find actually this is a very a commercial way, a commercially viable way to, to fabricate medium to large scale structural metallic parts. Uh, and as long as it can be welded, we can look for it to be printed. That, that is the thing. Um, however, there's still some uh, issues about this technology is because you still need some form of processing. Uh, but uh, if you see that this is what I show you here is sufficient for your application, then probably you, you can just stop there. Uh, because uh, for, for the field that I'm in, uh, where it's manufacturing, there's some form of precision to the part that you required, which need a second, secondary additional process to post-process this uh, uh, part that we printed. All right. Uh, well, I just want to highlight two uh, key players, uh, Cranfield University, that actually mostly focus on aerospace parts. Uh, you can see that actually this is one of the pictures they have, uh, printing one of a, aero, aero, uh, a wind plane structure uh, uh, in titanium. Uh, and then the, uh, there's also a RAM lab, uh, uh, which is actually they, they have proven to prove to, to capable to show to print a, a, a big propeller right on their end uh, that actually has been certified for marine offshore applications. All right, so so this technology actually is gaining traction these few years, uh, and and actually uh, not no, not only that actually is meant for uh, aesthetic uh, uh, geometry printing purpose, but even actually able to meet the strength requirements for most of the structural components. All right, and you can see that this is highly applicable in the various areas, variety of areas such as oil and gas, marine aerospace, and building constructions. Uh, so how this works is actually you have an electric arc as a heat source and a wire as a feedstock, uh, and typically any of the welding processes can be used uh, to achieve this kind of um, uh, printing, right? Uh, such as gas metal arc welding, plasma arc welding, or or even uh, gas tungsten arc welding. All right, so you're just building this layer by layer. Uh, any motion system can be used, can be highly large scale, which means that you can put on a gantry system uh, uh, and, and actually put a robot arm on that and do this kind of welding purpose. Or you can have it structured in, on site uh, where you have a robot platform mounted on a fixed table or even integrate some form of CNC machine for your application. So, so um, uh, the technology looks great, but actually there's, there's a few things that you probably need to overcome in order to uh, make this viable. Uh, the key part actually is understanding the process, uh, what constitutes bead, good bead formation, and all these are very material dependent. And also understanding how each of these bead can be overlaid. Uh, for instance, uh, what is the overlapping weave they can have, how much height overlap they can have, and what type of uh, overhanging capability they have. Because uh, we, are, we are fighting against gravity, all right? So it doesn't, it, it, it's impossible for us to print something 90 degrees, all right? So there's a limit in the angle geometry that you can do. Uh, and of course, all this information you need to build up in order to uh, generate the necessary tool path to reduce stack up error and residual stress form, uh, right? And, and, and actually so that you get a very consistent print at the end. Uh, so just to show if this is not done well, these are the kind of problems you see, like error accumulating leading to uh, part print failure, uh, wrong process parameter leading to collapse or splatters, uh, unwanted wire, or even if you didn't pl plan your tool path well, you might have um, heavy residual stress built into your structure that cause some form of distortion when you finish the printing, right? These are very common for this. Uh, but I, I mean, the research committee actually working closely to understand all these so that uh, this can be overcome uh, for even larger scale manufacturing. All right, uh, and, and also a major challenge is the height control for this. Uh, and you need to be very consistent. If not, uh, uh, what you think you're printing uh, may be slightly skewed in the vertical sense, right? Okay, um, so in SUTD Excel itself, uh, or in the lab that we're actually working on, uh, we are developing a highly uh, intelligent, uh, uh, wire arc manufacturing system, which we call the adaptive HWAM. Uh, it's a hybrid manufacturing part where we, uh, we look into processes of combining uh, add and subtract processes uh, to, into the process. The, the subtractive processes was meant to aid the, um, 
the accuracy requirement because I can do some form of uh, in-process post-processing as I'm printing, which is the current limitation of this approach. Uh, and of course, with my robotics background, actually, we, we didn't stop there. We, we kind of closed the loop with actually interlayer sensing so that actually we can get to the final printer part as, uh, as close as possible. Especially this is especially important, especially you're printing something very huge uh, that leads to some form of uh, uh, error accumulation over multiple layers. So you will need this kind of interlayer uh, feedback loop sensing so that uh, the parts that you print after maybe weeks or months, all right, uh, won't go to waste, all right. Okay, uh, this is a setup we have in uh, SUTD, which consists of a robot arm, some subjective system, and some sensing system uh, that we can use it to print, all right. Um, you can see this is a small setup. I don't see this scaling up to something big, all right. Uh, Okay, uh, the important part is understanding the process and the manufacturing process leading to the outcome that we want. All right, uh, this shows you uh, one of the capability of a layer print that you can add based on the two path. All right, subsequently, you see that uh, there will be a sensing system to come in to understand what I'm printing. And based on this information, it informs how much I need to subtract so that I have a very consistent layer that I can build upon on. Uh, and can you see this actually is going to repeat over and over again, uh, right? Right. Uh, this this process seems to work for us, and and actually we have been uh, meeting most of the strength requirements given to us uh, based on this approach. Okay. Of course, to solve all this, uh, I, I won't drive into details. Uh, it's more that uh, one part is a two path. How do you fill up all these two path based on the geometry you have, which you need to take a three D object and and discretize it and slice it uh, and perform in view so that uh, uh, you know what robot toolpath you need to generate to create that kind of uh, uh, additive, subtractive, uh, and even uh, registrative, which is the scanning part, uh, to, to, to achieve that closed loop behavior. Uh, building the process, actually, uh, we have been relying a lot of uh, machine learning model, uh, which is a highly data-driven approach, where, where we feed some form of process parameters and look at the output, and based on that, we feed into some meta model that we are able to train that. Uh, and over time, with more and more data, we can actually use it to do some form of a robotic control, as well as understanding the production capability of these processes, uh, so that you have a better informed outcome, right, uh, in the choices of your process parameters. Um, and, and of course, with the model, you can do very, very interesting printing, which means that you can combine both two path and process changes. But you can see that I'm, I'm constantly changing my process parameters while I'm printing so that uh, I'm not constrained to print to a, a uniform uh, shape uh, print. Uh, but I could have a, a different varying geometry print at one end and thicker geometry print on the other end uh, to achieve this all in a single two path. All right. So, so these are the stuff that you can use to uh, machine learning for, which is actually very, very useful. It has been shown to work for, for our sense in actually retrieving the, uh, the actual printer part requirements and, and uh, uh, in this aspect. Of course, um, uh, with that, we can even push further and, uh, to build the overhang capability. Actually, we try to push even further to show that we can even print something as twisted as this uh, very, very easily uh, with the, all these models that we built, all right? You can see that uh, uh, it's a highly twisted element. It's a, hard, a full 180 twist, all right? Uh, uh, and, and you can have this kind of interesting structure, which, which actually can be printed easily, but based on traditional manufacturing technique, to do, do, to, to do this, you actually literally need to take a metal plate and actually work hard on it, twist it, uh, in order to get to this shape, all right? Uh, which is actually quite difficult and very time consuming. All right, uh, yeah, so AI is the buzzword. So uh, uh, we are actually currently working out a lot of uh, 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 AI uh, into this printing process because we are making use of the information that we gain from the printing, feeding it into our model uh, uh, so that actually uh, we can actually correct uh, our two path iteratively to achieve the outcome we want, right? And this, this video here shows you that actually uh, the height control that we implement uh, is able to control the surface height variation to a very consistent layer uh, 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 based on this AI learning and, and, and adaptive planning approach, uh, which is borrowed from the concept of reinforcement learning, right? Uh, 
If you have that, you can do something as nice as this, even after many printing tries. If not, you end up something like this and it might fail eventually, right? This is the type of error stack up you achieve in, in this kind of printing. Okay, with that, I'll end my talk here, just uh, on time, uh, that actually shows uh, some of the uh, work that actually we have uh, in applying these two uh, robot system into uh, uh, our, 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 our lab, right? Uh, so I'm happy to take questions if there's any. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, thank you, Dr. So, for the presentations. Uh, we have some questions, but uh, perhaps I'd uh, like to call upon our uh, uh, CNS director, uh, Dixon, to maybe moderate the questions. Dixon, would you uh, sure. kindly? Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. So. Uh, okay, uh, apparently, I think we have a few questions coming up. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think uh, the first question is for both speakers. Uh, the question uh, is uh, for the uh, robot platform. Uh, would it be um, other angles, uh, diagonals, or must it be flat or, or a horizontal platform? That, that is the first part of the question. Mm. Uh, second part is uh, how is the robot uh, able to read uh, by our uh, industry using um, this uh, BIM technology, which is the BIM technology? So maybe um, we can start off with Jeremy first. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I quite got the question. Uh, how, would, how would it integrate with uh, external software packages such as BIM? Yeah, correct. I think, um, okay, first part, um, the question was asking, uh, must the, I, I guess this must be the, uh, the, the robot be um, on a, a horizontal platform or can it be on an inclined kind of platform? Uh, then the second part is that um, how is this going to be integrated into the uh, beam technology? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so our uh, product Tybot um, is able to operate on a twelve percent grade and a twelve percent super elevation, which is the max designs in, in at least the bridge uh, specifications in the U.S. Um, so it can certainly go up and down uh, those inclines. Um, but currently does not operate on a vertical vertical surface. Um, we made a we made a specific point uh, to not uh, have our robots integrate with any external software. Uh, we don't think that BIM or uh, any of the other softwares have come to a true uh, winner yet and is not used uh, exclusively. So we wanted to make sure that our robots um, uh, operate in the same way in which. Uh, current workers operate, which is they see its intersection with their eyes and they go and tie the intersection. Uh, so there is no programming or bin input necessary. Um, you just put it over a rebar mat and say go. So it is actually an auto scanning and um, tying. La. There's no need for a program to be activated. La. That's correct. There is, there is no input whatsoever to the system. It, it sees it with its own vision system and does its own uh, calculations and adjustment uh, live. So, um, uh, posting back the question to uh, Dr. So. Oh, okay, so if, if, you, if you see the platform that I shared, uh, that actually um, is, is actually meant for horizontal deployment, but, but from roboticist's point of view, uh, having horizontal diagonal is not an issue. Uh, it's just probably require a different solution to bring uh, robots. As I focus more on lightweight robots, all right, uh, uh, cable-driven system is also a viable approach where, where you have cabling attached to a system and this system cables actually move in a large workspace uh, to, to position a robot and in factor in, in, in a three-dimensional space. Like, all right. Um, uh, so so I, I'll say that actually uh, uh, the local motion behavior for this kind of small robots, I, I think there's a lot of solution out there that that can cater a bunch of needs that you need. Um, and in, in terms of reading to BIM, uh, I didn't interface with BIM a lot, uh, but uh, um, uh, as long as there are, because if I deal with additive manufacturing, uh, uh, the typical software files that it, as long as I can read, I, I can actually read into the software we develop, uh, which is mostly open source, all right? Uh, and, and, and ROS packages, I'm not so sure how how well that is, but I mean, uh, it's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, the second question actually being posted is, um, 
Are this uh, construction robotics uh, requiring uh, this uh, internet uh, during the operations? That's first part of the question. Uh, and the second part is uh, how uh, do you guys monitor the task if it is uh, performing properly and uh, how do we detect the, uh, these errors and mistakes? I can, I can start. Uh, so uh, our, our products uh, do not require an internet connection. Um, you know, all processing computer wise is, is done on board the system. Um, and uh, the, the second question, right, monitoring performance. Uh, so we have a, a, a combination of own self diagnostics. Uh, so actually our, our machine uh, has an understanding of its spatial 3D spatial constraints. Um, so it'll actually prevent itself from getting into uh, obstacles that, it, that, it, that are in the way. Um, it also, you know, understands through various uh, motor feedbacks and current feedbacks, um, whether it's stuck. Uh, so it actually, if it's in a very tight uh, intersect, intersection area, it will try three different ways and three different uh, uh, slightly changes in its configuration in order to create a successful tie. Um, and of course, uh, we have uh, uh, a worker that will be along with it because we have to continue to feed it wire because it keeps tying, uh, tying and using up wire. Uh, so we of course uh, can check on it and see if anything is, is missed. Um, yeah, and uh, for okay. Dr. Yeah, my turn, right. Uh, so uh, internet, no, I mean, uh, we, uh, 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 I mean, there's a direction actually we're working on is uh, collaborative robots, lah, which means that uh, uh, I don't really need to be connected to the internet so that you can remote from uh, access from somewhere, but, but uh, adding communication means to, for robot to robot to communicate with each other uh, uh, is, is, is also one of the direction that we are going on this. Lah. But for the platform I showed you earlier, no, it's fully autonomous. You don't need any uh, internet connection for this. Uh, we operate on this. How do we ensure that what we are doing uh, is, is, is uh, uh, the task at hand, right? Uh, we, we, we have some form of uh, feedback loop system, la, which means it's a closed system. Uh, it's, it's form of control, la, which means that I know this is the task. Uh, I, I have sensors to sense it, that what it's doing, is it correct? And, and use that sensor information to feedback on how should I correct as I'm doing this task. La. So, so it's more like a closed loop control aspect that, that we have that. Uh, but this is a great question like, because ultimately you want to look at how the whole overall system uh, uh, is, right? Uh, which probably um, uh, uh, another, there might be another solutions to look at this. La. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's another question coming um, in. Um, so the question was, uh, so there's no real-time data analysis required in uh, the systems? So that, that's a, uh, uh, I don't know if I fully understand the, the question in terms of data analysis. Of course, any fully autonomous robot has to continually take the sensor data, analyze the data in order to decide what it sees and how it's going to act. Um, that's why it's an autonomous robot. Um, in terms of uh, statistics, you know, we, we do keep track of successful and unsuccessful tying operations um, and able to feed that back to the system as well as to keep uh, basically data trends uh, over the course of a large project doing hundreds of thousands of ties. Um, so there is uh, those sort of two forms of data analysis that we, we deal with. Okay. Um, for me, um, uh, uh, I think generally they cover, right? Because most autonomous systems have some form of sensing capability and data analysis of what uh, it's, it's actually sensing to do some form of informed decision on what to do next. Um, for, for my additive manufacturing part, uh, um, we, we do some form of uh, the final product print uh, in terms of even though we have this close loop going on but we still also analyze uh, what what is the variation of the total print that we have uh, as a final output right um, uh, so that we better have a sense of uh, uh, how should we better even inform our uh, improve our algorithm 
to to make it less uh, uh to make it even more consistent yeah yeah i think and there's another question uh, just for jeremy uh but i think uh, okay maybe i just post this out to jeremy uh if the uh thai bot is uh autonomous uh it has to run on a certain programming in the robot right so so again i'm not i'm not don't know if i fully understand the question so i'll answer in the two different ways uh so there there is no programming required by the construction worker itself uh meaning that there's no uh you know bim input or plans that it has to tell where the rebar is of course it being an autonomous robot we have lots of programs uh, running inside of the the brains of the system um and uh that allows it to you know see the intersections tie them and and know which intersection to go to next then of course go across the uh, across the rebar mat and then go forward on the rebar mat uh is all self-contained uh, inside of the the product. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I think I understand um, the, the, that part of it. Um, uh, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, uh, uh, Thaibot is basically an auto sensing machine that actually does the uh, uh, rebar tying. Like, there's no need for um, basically, I mean, basically, that there's no need for uh, uh, supervision or programming. Like, basically, you just set up the machine lay the rebars and the robot would actually uh, does the, the, the tying up. That, that's correct. There is, there is no external input into the system. It, it, it is, you just put it over top of the mat, on top of the rebar mat, say go, and it, and it does all the rest all by itself. I think uh, we just nice comes to the uh, end of the session. Uh, um, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Dr. So. Uh, to summarize, um, it's an uh, eye-opener for me uh, as an engineer. Uh, I mean, I'm quite involved in a couple of um, this uh, new tech, um, DFMA and all those. But honestly, uh, the idea of robotics has never crossed my mind uh, until uh, today's session. Uh, it's really an eye-opener, something that I have to take back and think how we actually can uh, integrate uh, into the local markets. La. I think in Singapore markets, uh, we are always talking about uh, manpower crunches. So uh, whatever resources, whatever technologies that can come in, uh, would actually be helpful. La. And of course, uh, taking this uh, over to international projects, uh, basically what we are also looking at is uh, what we call uh, the, the uh, manpower uh, workmanship. La. So of course, uh, with robotics coming in and all those uh, workmanship uh, errors and all those can be greatly reduced. So this is um, one of the aspects, uh, I think, for, for uh, those, uh, what we call the developing countries or overseas markets. So this is where I think uh, we as Singapore can bring this technology over together uh, and actually be you know, incorporating into our projects. Uh, maybe Lee Hao? Um, uh, well, we, we had a wonderful session. I think that there are lots of questions, you know, very pertinent questions. We're trying to grapple with uh, uh, the, the impact of, of your, 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 your technologies and your and, and the applications and all that. So we, we, we look forward uh, and very excitedly uh, in the coming months and, and, and possibly years uh, when we can see your technologies invading the market and making the impact that, uh, that they, they, they should be. Um, but if there's nothing further, because we have to end the session now, if there's nothing further, then uh, we would like to thank uh, Jeremy for spending a good hour and a half with us, uh, Dr. So as well for sharing you. uh, your technologies. We look forward to staying in touch with you guys. Uh, and for everybody in the audience, uh, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook Live, thank you so much for spending the last hour and plus with us. Uh, but don't go away yet, because uh, the next session is at 2 p.m. Uh, Singapore time. So please tune in at 2 p.m. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.